When we talk about our eventual retirements, it doesn't take long to shift from dreaming of endless European river cruises to waking up to the cold, hard reality of how many dollars we'll need. The retirement math linchpin on which our fantasies of Tuesday afternoon naps and 2 p.m. virgin margaritas rely is the 4% rule introduced by Bill Bangan. Basically, all of financial planning relies on his work. So the 4% rule says retirees can reasonably expect to withdraw 4% of their portfolio in their first year of retirement, then adjust upward for inflation annually for 30 years without ever running out of money. The Phi community wears t-shirts with Bill Bangan's face on them underneath all of their clothes because the 4% rule is the spell that makes early retirement magic possible. So guess who's joining me today? That's right. Bill freaking Bangin. Bill was the first person to use actual historical returns and inflation to determine what retirees could spend, because before that, financial planners just relied on averages, which tended to smooth out the choppiness of history. So if we know a portfolio can usually support 4% withdrawals each year, that means 4% of our portfolio value has to be equal to our annual spending. To figure out how much we need, we can multiply our annual spending by 25, hashtag math. For example, if you spend $40,000 per year, your portfolio would need to be worth a million dollars in order for 4% of it to be $40,000 per year. Now, critics who have not bothered to explore the underlying research are always quick to point out, but what about inflation? Don't worry, my dear catastrophizer Bill Bangin and those who duplicated his research at Trinity University accounted for that. But as you'll hear Bill say today, inflation is a big variable in whether or not the 4% rule continues to be effective. So that's the TLDR. And if you want more 4% rule basics, we did a deep dive episode last year. We'll link it in the description. But today I asked Bill to weigh in on a few key misconceptions and we dig into what the 4% rule means for investors in 2023's economic environment. I also hit Bill with a theory of my own that there's a little discussed reason why the 4% rule might actually be more conservative than it needs to be. To start, I asked Bill to set the stage for us. How does our current situation compare to the worst time period that he analyzed in his research? That's a great question. The 4% rule, if you want to call it, I actually use 4.8% now as the worst case scenario. It's based on the individual who retired in October of 1968 because they ran into a buzzsaw. They hit two bad, terrible pair of markets back to back. And then they had years of inflation, which forced them to raise the withdrawals. So they got hit from both sides, terrible portfolio returns, very high withdrawals, and that's why their money ran out so early. I am con I'm concerned because there are two factors that uh, historic, in my research show historically affect withdrawal rates. One is the how early in retirement you uh, experience a really bad bear market. And the other one is what your inflation rate is. Both of these factors you know, contribute to the depletion of your portfolio. And quite frankly, if you look at January 2022, with a Schiller P.E. ratio uh, being around 40, inflation you know, approaching 8% or higher, those are two numbers that have never occurred in the data in the U.S. before together. Uh, and I think a lot of what happens will rely upon how quickly inflation is tamed. If, if the Fed can do it and knock it out in a few years, we may have a chance of having the so-called 4% or 4.8% rule survive. But if inflation continues or gets worse, uh, we may be headed for a new worst case. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I advise people, even if I recommend 4, 8.8% historically, they start out with something less than that in this environment, just to be safe, because we don't know where it's going. We may be in a whole new regime. Man, I miss when things were precedented. That said, the withdrawals that we're typically discussing when we talk about the 4% rule research uniformly raised spending with inflation, right? So if you spent $100,000 as a retiree in 2022 and inflation is 8%, you'd increase your spending for 2023 by 8% and spend $108,000. And over time, your portfolio should be able to withstand such increases. But, and here's what I think we often gloss over, all of your spending isn't impacted by inflation 
equally. For example, most people's largest expenses are things like their mortgage, their vehicles, and what's true about those payments. They are typically fixed costs. So to make this point a little more saliently, if you spend $100,000 per year, that breaks down to $8,333 per month. And if you're the average American, your mortgage likely makes up roughly 30% of that total. Since insurance and taxes are subject to change, let's look at principal and interest alone, assuming you've got one of those handy dandy 30 year fixed rate deals. Call it $2,500 a month. Let's throw in a single car payment, say $500 a month, which is around the US average in 2021. Taken together, the fixed portion of your monthly spend is roughly $3,000 or $36,000 per year, which is a full 36% of your annual spending. This means 36% of your spending is fixed. It's not subject to inflationary factors. And keep this example in your back pocket for later. But first, I wanted to bounce the theory off of Bill and ask him what he thought about it. Yeah, I, I think your point is well taken. If you're an individual who has of his own personal inflation rate is lower than the national, the CPI, or whatever, PC, whatever you want to use. Yes, uh, you probably will find that uh, numbers I give are a little bit conservative and that uh, you're going to end up with a lot of money when you're dead. Which is like the worst <laughs> time to have a lot of money, right? Yeah, that's tough to spend. But there's another little known fact about the actual numbers used in his analysis that sometimes surprises people. It turns out that the media latched on to 4%, nice round number, when in reality, he originally stress tested with 4.15%. When I published my first paper back in 94, the number I got was 4.15%. And that actually generated a 100% success rate historically. So you could consider that safe, although, you know, I have to be careful using that word because going forward, who knows, conditions could be different. And yeah, I, I use that 4.15% rate and it's an annoying thing because you could round it down to 4.1, round it up to 4.2, but um, everyone else rounded it down to 4 <laughs> through no uh, effort of my part. And that's where we were stuck for a long time until I did follow-up research, you know, in around 2006 and published a, a book uh, and came up with a 4.5% rate for 100% success rate and updated it since then. Of course, these findings are based on historical data, and critics are quick to point out that Bankin's research relied on the U.S. stock market during a time of prolonged U.S. economic dominance. The original research just had two asset classes, intermediate-term U.S. Treasury bonds and uh, U.S. large-cap stocks. Not exactly a diversified portfolio, but, you know, had to start from somewhere. He reanalyzed in 2020 using a few more asset classes. I added small cap stocks uh, primarily because uh, get the most bang for the buck out of them. You know, they had a higher return than large cap stocks and the correlation was uh, not too high. Uh, so as a result, when you put them in there, you got a, a big jump from 4.15 to 4.5%. Even then, I knew I didn't have. So a few years ago, yeah, I added uh, a few more asset classes and raised it a little bit more. Uh, Oh, I think we're starting to reach the points of diminishing returns. Okay, 2020, I looked at instead of three asset classes, I used seven. So I added in the equity area, micro cap U.S. stocks, mid cap U.S. stocks, uh, international stocks, uh, and also U.S. Treasury bills. And they, those three asset, four asset classes raised from about 4.5 to 4.8. I added a lot more asset classes, but I didn't get that big a bump. And that's why I'm indicating to you that we're probably approaching some kind of a limit, you know, of 5%. While history isn't a perfect measure for the future, in the black box of retirement planning, it's the closest thing we have to accurate guidance. And I wanted to know how Bill felt about the U.S. heavy nature of the research moving forward and whether or not we should expect lower returns in the future. Ray Dalio, for example, one of the foremost voices warning that U.S. hegemonic power is coming to an end and that has serious implications for U.S. investments. Fair question. This is a great place over the last, you know, 100 years to invest compared to many other areas. Great admirer of Ray Dalio and the work that he's done. You know, fetching the area of personal philosophy, I think it's fabulous, but also the area of history of economic cycles is fascinating to me. I, it's really hard for me to judge. I, I would rather rely on somebody like Warren Buffett, who's a real genius, who uh, says repeatedly, 
that you know uh, America is a great place to invest in and will be for a long time. If you look at our markets, even though they have difficulties, we've had a little trouble here the few week for with a few banks. I understand our markets are very well regulated. They're open. They're free. They're very flexible. They have a, they're enormous in size. I suspect that. Uh, the U.S. will still continue to do well, although our growth rates might slow down uh, as time goes on. It's really hard for me to predict those things. Of course, in the last recession, bond yields were so low that there was no alternative to stocks. But now things are a little different. There are CDs paying upward of 5%, which feels like a much safer bet than stocks if you're relying on your capital for cash flow. And it might surprise you what Bill himself is invested in. My own investment portfolio, and I don't recommend to anybody, I'm not giving you investment advice, is uh, 2% stocks right now and 3% gold and 90% CDs. <laughs> and I don't think I've had a portfolio that weird in my lifetime. But when you can get 5% plus in federally insured CDs or treasury bills, and the stock market has prospective returns over the next 10 years of zero to 1%. I mean, should you really be having a lot of your money in stocks at this point? Does that make sense? That's what investors have to ask themselves. I, I, I'm enjoying this bear market because I, I, I'm getting good income, which I didn't. Remember, the last one was terrible. Yeah, there was no alternative. That Tina thing, you know, that's... Uh, my research is based upon buy and hold because it's an easy way to analyze things. But that doesn't mean investors have to follow that investing philosophy in their own portfolio. Clearly, investors have a lot of decisions to make, not the least of which is how much to withdraw. So how does our earlier example, where 36% of someone's spending was fixed, play out. If we take our 100k per year example a step further, our spending would only increase from 100k to 105k instead of 108k in a year of 8% inflation. Now, that doesn't seem like much of a break, but much like our returns, it compounds over time for two reasons. The first is that your unspent $3,000 stays invested and it continues to compound. The second is that 8% of 105K is less than 8% of 108K. A 105K annual withdrawal turns into 110,500 withdrawal after another year of 8% inflation, compared to what would have been 116,600, and so on. Over time, your spending that's insulated from inflation will create this cushy compounding buffer, lowering your withdrawal amount even a little bit helps to bolster the success of your portfolio over time, demonstrating the power of those fixed expenses remaining impervious to inflation. Now, your related expenses on the periphery will probably still go up over time. Think car insurance, property taxes, maintenance, but the bulk is relatively fixed. Remember how our original example created a difference in withdrawal of about $2,500 in year one and around $6,000 in year two? If you extend our example for 20 years where all 100,000 is being increased by 8% inflation every year versus only 64% of our initial $100,000 of spending being increased by inflation every year and then the other 36% just remaining static, your withdrawals from the uniform inflation portfolio are up to $431,000, while your withdrawals from the partially fixed spending portfolio are only $312,000. Now, in both cases, these sound like a ton of money because I'm pretending we'll have consistent 8% inflation for the next 20 years, but that's just to keep the example steady. Though, as you can see, it makes a really big difference over time. At the end of the day, so much hinges on what inflation does over the next several years, and I was surprised at the extent to which Bill thinks how the Fed handles inflation will determine whether his now-adjusted 4.8% safe withdrawal rate will continue to work in the decades to come. As he said, it could be a new worst-case scenario, but we don't know. After an extended period of low interest rates and low inflation, the last few years have been a rude awakening that, oh yeah, sometimes the prices of things rise and rise quickly. But that's why it was important to me that we couched this broader discussion of the 4% rule in 2023 within the context of what you can control, your personal inflation rate. And fortunately for you, you may have some fixed expenses working in your favor already. As Bill highlighted, the amount of money you're withdrawing is one of the only things you can control when you are living off of your assets. Great. 
another consideration for retirement planning, but at least this one can be used to justify a sick new retirement swag mobile, right? With a fixed cost. At the end of the day, there are two truths that we can hold simultaneously. Number one, looking back, we know the safe withdrawal rate for a well-diversified portfolio could be as high as 4.8% per year. And number two, Moving forward, we may be in truly unprecedented territory and the Fed getting inflation under control could make a big difference for new retirees, meaning a more conservative approach might be warranted to preserve your capital, at least in the beginning. And if you want to hear the full episode of this week's Money with Katie show, click the video that just popped up on the screen and in the description of this video. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Hannah Velez and me, Katie Gaddy Tossan. Deb and Emery is our chief content officer and our video editors are Christy Muldoon, Sebastian Vega, and Nicole Friedman. Additional fact-checking comes from Kate Brandt.